Hello and welcome to Lit Visions, a podcast about fiction, its future and other possibilities in literature. My name's Dhruv and I'm your host. Today I speak with someone whom I discovered through my previous guest, James Yu, the co-founder of Pseudowrite. So back in May, James tweeted about a new novel called Reaper, which he described as cerebral near-future sci-fi grounded in reality. I was pretty intrigued, so I bought the book and messaged the author, Elliot Pepper, who was kind enough to reply and then be present for this podcast. Elliot is based in Oakland, California, and is the author of 10 novels. His works have received amazing reviews from people and organizations like Seth Godin, The New York Times Book Review, and Popular Science. And his latest book, Reaper, has again captured imaginations around the world. The story follows a quantum computer scientist, a virologist, a podcaster, a venture capitalist, and an assassin who all collide and change the course of future history. It's a gripping adventure that weaves a number of complex themes in wonderful tapestry. Themes like ambition, secrecy, transgression, the price of progress, and how technology shapes our lives and world. Now, in our conversation, Elliot shares his inspiration for Reaper, but we mainly discuss other topics, such as how speculative fiction can be a tool for social change, the future's relationship with the present, what are the best ways to sell novels, and the role of place in storytelling, looking specifically at his home city, Oakland in California. We also reflect on Eliot's creative influences like William Gibson, and towards the end, we even speculate on the future of fiction. This is a long conversation, but I highly recommend listening to it in full. Elliot has a fascinating perspective on almost everything, and it's such a pleasure to see him think. I hope you enjoy it. Here's Elliot Pepper. So, Elliot, what does fiction mean to you? So I've, I've always been just in love with stories. So I, my parents sent me to this weird uh, elementary school and um, it was it's called a Waldorf school so they have this like edu- special educational philosophy that is would take way too long for us to get into on on this during this conversation however um, one of the unusual classes that they would always uh, teach you know first second third graders is you would have a class called handwork where you literally learned how to like knit and crochet, like like sewing, like that kind of stuff. And they would have these class projects where, you know, you'd have to make a teddy bear or, you know, knit a sweater, like things like that, right? So you'd you'd be you'd be sort of every individual student would be working on their project. And the teacher, the handwork teacher, while we worked, while we were crocheting or sewing or whatever, um, would read us stories. And often they were sort of fables or, you know, myths, like appropriate for second and third, you know, first and second graders, right? And uh, every single year that I was in handwork, um, I, like the sweater I made, the teddy bear I knitted or whatever, every single time, mine was the smallest of the entire class. So everybody would have like a big, I don't know, a knit dragon or something like that. And mine would be like a tiny lizard. Um, And uh, the reason is that I was always just sitting at the front of the class, completely absorbed in the story that our teacher was telling us. And so what was, I was like the least disruptive possible student. I just failed to accomplish anything at all um, because I was completely transported. And I really think that that's the power of fiction. Um, It can invite you into beyond your life experience. It it invites you into new worlds, into other hearts, other minds, other lives. And it allows you to to just take a journey in in imagination. And I think that that's tremendously powerful. Um, And that's why I 
that's why I love it. That's, you know, that, that isn't limited to fables you hear from your grandmother or your teacher. You know, that's literature, that's uh, film and television and plays and poetry. Um, all of these forms of fiction um, invite us into this other world. Um, and it's a world that, that obviously takes place inside our imaginations, inside our own hearts. And I think that's really profound and it's a, a beautiful complement to the physical world that we, that we inhabit. Wow, spoken like such a fiction writer. I absolutely love it. I was I was almost uh -oh. expecting like an an, uh, an academic answer, and that was the, I think that was uh, a beautiful story in and of itself. So, thank you for sharing. Um, I'd be really curious if we could let's say fast forward from that beautiful class that you had right in in first or second grade. Um, and tell us just a little bit about your journey uh, since then as uh, a reader and a writer. Um, I should forewarn you, I've heard a lot of your interviews over the last week, so ah, I know a bunch okay. of these, these stories. And I know that like um, uh, you talk a lot about how uh, the journey for you started as a reader, right? And, and mm -hmm. not necessarily as a writer. So maybe we could just uh, take it from that. Sure. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, sort of like you said, like I always think of myself as a reader first and a writer second. Um, uh, honestly, I'm still that same little boy who's failing to knit a dragon, um, and uh, and and so I I I love I love stories. Um, I I love fiction, and that love of fiction is is what shapes my own writing. Um, so. Uh, if you are curious about writing fiction yourself and you were to say, Google, how do I write a novel? Um, the, there are a lot, I mean, writers like nothing more than to write about writing. Yeah. So the internet is full of hot takes of people who are very happy to, to explain how you should go about writing your novel. Um, I didn't do that at all. Actually, when I, wrote my first novel, I just read a lot. Um, it, I was working um, uh, at a series of tech startups and then at a venture capital firm um, investing in, in new technology companies. And so I, I wasn't doing any writing professionally. I didn't get, uh, you know, I didn't study English in university or anything like that. I just liked reading a lot. And I had an idea for a book I wanted to read but couldn't find. And that's why I wrote my first book. I just, there was a story that I thought I would like that I couldn't find to enjoy myself. And so I was, and so I just sat down and I opened up Microsoft Word and I started typing chapter one and uh, that was it. Uh, I just, I, I wound up enjoying the process a lot. Um, and like, we can talk about how that evolved over time if, if you if you want to, but that was, that was really the first piece of it for me. I didn't uh, join a writer's group. I didn't, I don't know, go to like conventions. I didn't know anything about the industry or even more than the industry, just like uh, how writers talk about their approach to writing. I just sort of winged it based on what I liked reading. And frankly, that has been tremendously powerful for me. I mean, I have, so one thing that's sort of interesting about writing fiction is you have a ton as the author, I mean, you can do whatever you want. You don't have multi-million dollar budgets riding on every creative decision, like with a you know big budget movie. Um, you, you know, you really have a lot of leeway. It's just text like that. One of the beautiful things about literature is that it's so cheap to produce. It just takes the writer's time, right? And so that gives you just a tremendous amount of tr creative freedom that is pretty unique among uh, narrative mediums. And so um, I really love that. And what's ended up happening is that as a writer, really my taste as a reader is what shapes my craft as a writer. Um, I just read a lot. And so I have, you know, you sort of learn what you like, just like if you enjoy wine, you might learn that you like Bordeaux, but you really don't like Pinot Noir or whatever, um, or, or apply to anything in your life. And, uh, and for me, that's what it is with stories. Um, basically, that at every stage of the process, from like the sort of initial, um, uh, 
buckets of ideas that like might go into the book to sort of what, what I'm about to write next, the next sentence, the next chapter, the next book, um, to revision, right? Like where you're trying to polish and, and develop a story to publication, um, to giving notes to the cover designer. Um, at every point, I'm trying to go back to that and use that as my lodestone. Like, what would I love? What would I appreciate as a reader? Wow, there's so many uh, questions I have um, as a result <laughs> of all of that. I think <laughs> right? one, one thing that struck me immediately is how you almost approached writing a novel like uh, a founder or an entrepreneur would <laughs> go to solve a product problem. Right, sure. um, and I, I, it's not something I've, I've, uh, um, I, I deeply relate because um, I'm an entrepreneur myself that mm. loves fiction, and I do think there are a lot of parallels between those two worlds, more parallels than people actually realize beyond, you know, uh, beyond the, the surface. Um, but yeah, I, I'd be very curious if you could perhaps dive into that first idea if you're comfortable sharing. Um, and and sure. maybe talk a little bit about your process as well, because um, I find it also like it's almost a wonderful irony that you were at a venture capital firm at the time. Mm. Right. And they are investing in people that are going like to solve problems and looking for mm -hmm. big, meaningful problems to solve. And oftentimes when that problem isn't solved, you put on your entrepreneurial hat and you build a product and, and do it yourself. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that journey. Yeah. Um, so there are a few ways that that connects in. So the, the first was sort of the topic of the first novel. Um, I had worked in a number of different startups and I had obviously, I, I co-founded a, a small company and then um, I was an EIR at this VC firm. So I was dropping into different startups and helping the founders to get past their next growth milestones. And so basically I had all, like I had had these, a series of experiences in these small teams of really passionate, bright, energetic, determined people who were trying to do something really hard for the first time together. And you very quickly find out that, I mean, there's, there's a lot of natural human drama there, right? I mean, just imagine you go on a camping trip with your friends and you're trying to organize logistics for the camping trip. Like you already, you probably have already experienced a good amount of drama from that. Now imagine that, you know, you and all of your friends' income depends on this camping trip working, right? And that there's a flood and that, right? Like just throw complications in. And so there, I had just experienced a lot of uh, that struggle um, and I didn't, like, if you read about uh, startups, there are a lot of business books out there that collate lessons learned or advice. Some of them are memoir where they'll, like, share stories. You know, often it's, like, a successful business person then writes, writes up their life experience. Um, but most of them are really cleaned up. Um, some of them are very good, but a lot of them... Uh, didn't feel like they connected with the internal experience of going through that kind of a project with people you're really close to and care about. They might have, they might be mapping out the tactical things, the objective external experience of like, here's a way to think about business. If you're in this kind of a situation, like try this or that. Um, and, and I don't want to degrade that. That's, that can be very valuable. Just like, you know, if you if your sync breaks, look it up on YouTube. YouTube is amazing. You will be able to fix your sync yourself, probably, right? Um, so, like, yep. there was a lot of that. You, you don't need to read a poem about syncs in that moment in right, time. You right. need to <laughs> exactly, exactly. But the human experience of being of of that kind of of setting out on that kind of a quest together is really profound. And and I couldn't. I just couldn't find stories that felt legit, that felt like they captured what that was like from the inside. And that's why I wrote my first novel. So it, it follows a pair of founders who 
drop out of university to start a, a software company that winds up getting roped into a, an international financial conspiracy. So they sort of go from garage to IPO and get caught up in this huge, uh, yeah, sort of like thriller story along the way. Um, and it so and it started as one novel, but it eventually became it was a trilogy um, to cover the whole arc. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of how I go out got into it. And I do think you're right. I mean, I think that I if I would to if I were to draw an emotional parallel between like th- there are some other parallels that might be interesting to discuss as well. Like for example, if you are a founder or or a, a tech investor. I mean, you're thinking about the future by definition, right? Like that you're, you're inventing a, a world that doesn't exist in your head and then you're trying to build a bridge from here to there. That's what you're up to. And so there's a lot of parallels between that and some of the speculative fiction that I write. But I think that there's also an internal parallel where something I, something I learned um, from having these experiences in startups uh, that I don't think is like my natural inclination of my personality, which was why it was so interesting to learn and and felt uncomfortable but exciting, is just the idea of a bias to action that uh, that you know if if your sink does break. I feel like my natural inclination is to be like, well, like call the repair guy, right? Or, or maybe we need to move, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> um, and, but like someone who has that sort of like bias to action, it's like, oh wait, like what can I do about this? Like, it doesn't mean I can't call the repair guy. It doesn't mean I can't eventually move if there's a series that series of a plumbing problem, but. Um, but that you just see what you can do about it, right? That you you do look it up on YouTube. You go out and get a wrench and just like get your hands dirty. And I think that's something I learned only through experience that wasn't really like part of my personality. Some people, it's like their natural way of operating in the world. And for me, it was a learned thing. And so that's also how I approach writing and publishing. That's why I was like, oh, well, okay, I have this idea for this story. Why don't I just give it a try? Um, and, and so, yeah, I think it has shaped how I've gotten into this weird line of work, um, in a way that I certainly didn't anticipate going in. That is so cool. Um, and I, I think speak on behalf of a lot of people, really glad that you did get into this weird line of work. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. Um, Thank you. 10 novels in. <laughs> so uh, just linked to this, um, a question that came to mind is around thinking of novels as products. Um, yeah, do you think of novels as products? And if so, mm. why and perhaps what are the, uh, the nuances between, let's say, a quote-unquote product and, <laughs> and a novel? Sure, yeah. So um, I don't think of a novel as a product at all while I'm writing it. So when I'm writing a novel, I'm just trying to create something I would enjoy as a reader. And that's the only thing... I'm thinking about, um, I, you know, I, actually a lot of interviewers ask about genre um, and I don't think about genre at all. Uh, uh, it, it's like I, I that's not a part of how I approach writing a story. Um, however, once the manuscript is ready, which can which is an unpredictable process. Right. So with my latest novel there, I had to do more revision and more substantial revision than any previous book. So you really don't know how long it'll take and it can be very unpredictable. But once once you're ready to share that novel with readers, um, that's to me when it becomes a product, right? So the minute that you're like, okay, this is the story. Now, how do we package that story in the right way for the right people? How do we get it into the hands of the right people? How do we set the right expectations so that they will be delighted and satisfied by the experience of getting connected with and enjoying the novel? How do you how do you create opportunities for them to discover other relevant work or like your your other novels if they would like them at all? Or you know, all of those questions are questions about publishing. They're not questions about 
writing. They're not questions about, you know, what happens in this scene or uh, how does this character grow or react in a way that you weren't expecting even when you were planning out that sequence, right? Like, it, it's a question of how does this piece of work make it out into the world and how can you shepherd it? Um, and so, to, so that's, for me, that's when it flips, when I think, okay, uh, now I have this story I've written, this piece of art, how, how can we help get it to the right people? Um, so I'd say that's how I, that's how I would conceptualize like novel as product. I think that, um, novels are strange products as far as products go. So if you, you know, that was me thinking as a writer, looking onto the business side. If you think from the business side, looking at <laughs> writing fiction, um, they're really weird product. I mean, they like almost none of the ways in which you would typically market most products work for novels. Just ask any publisher, right? Um, so, and it's really basic why. Just think about, again, start as a reader. Why did you read the last book you read? Probably because someone you trust recommended it. Whether that was a personal friend who was like, ooh, this is so you, like you need to read this book. Or whether you listen to a podcast interview like this one and you really connected with something the host said or the guest said, and you were like, I wanna hear more from that person or I wonder what that whole thing is about. Um, and, and that's how you find your way in. And so novels are almost entirely, like the commercial success of novels, like their sales are almost entirely driven by word of mouth. And word of mouth, like, is sort of a dark art, right? Like, how do you, how do you get people to talk about the thing you made? Like, that's a that's a tough one. Um, and people have been trying to, you know, figure out how to do that for millennia. <laughs> um, and uh, and a lot of the, I'd say that the sort of like tried and true or like like current best practice in like the business world for marketing products just doesn't apply um, to fiction. But I do think that there are things that the business world can learn from, from marketing fiction because, uh, because it's so unusual. It, you have none of the, you have so few tools at your disposal. So you really have to do the, you know, try to do word of mouth right. And a lot of other businesses do word of mouth wrong. Um, at least in my experience. So in my experience, when you're releasing a new novel, the thing, the, basically the only thing I do when I release a new novel is uh, like personally email or message people who I think would have a specific and genuine reason to want to read the book. So that might be because they're like a big fan of a previous book of mine, or maybe it's that like, we subscribe to each other's newsletters and have a lot of like ongoing threads of discussion and something they are interested in, like I riff on in the book. It could be any any reason, right? But that they have a real reason. And I just ask if I can send them an early copy. I don't even, I don't ask them to blurb it. I don't ask them to do anything except accept a gift. And that's it. And then um, often that leads to, you know, if they get excited about it, then they message me, but they're like, oh, I really like this thing on page 17 or what have you. Um, but, but that's it. That, and in my experience, that's sort of the only way I have found to, uh, to support word of mouth because it's not something you can engineer. All you can do is try to get your thing to people who might genuinely love it and then like be nice to them like, and hope for the best <laughs> feels like there's there's such a uh i don't know what the right i don't know if purity is the right word but there feels a real sort of purity in the process of not just crafting fiction but even like sharing it with the world something that's really really uh almost like blissfully unoptimized about the whole thing, um, uh, which doesn't seem to be 
which I know for a fact is not the case in the product world where everything yeah. is sort of yeah. measurable, trackable, hyper optimized to the point where it almost like almost bastardizes the essence of the product or the work, right? And the effort to like grow it. I don't know if that resonates with you at all. No, no. I mean, it does. I, I'm just, you know, I, I'm sure there are great reasons why people go to such dramatic extents to sort of engineer metrics on how they market other products. I can't speak to that. But what I can speak to is my own experience with fiction. And my own experience with fiction is none of that works anyway. So, uh, like, I mean, all you're doing is creating a bunch of more hot air on the Internet, which no one needs. Right. Yep. Um, and, and I think that that's also part of the nature of fiction, of, of like books, of literature, is that it's about human connection. Right. Like that's ultimately like that's what you're getting to. And so I think that if you were to try to to optimize it like in that way in the growth hacker way um y you would get you would attract the wrong people um and for the wrong reason for the right it's sort of just like sort of you're just going off in a totally different direction um and i don't know that like anyone listening who is curious about the business of books it is a weird little world and like i have a very idi idiosyncratic experience of it so i encourage you to learn your own lessons and then you can come on the podcast and tell everyone how i was wrong and how you have uh the the, the best algorithmic approach to marketing books but for me i really love that and there's actually a side effect of it that's really wonderful um which is that um, I actually get to interact with readers. When you, when you write books, it's really solitary. I'm spending most of my time at this desk on this computer um, by myself or going on walks with the dog and you know, thinking through a story problem. But a lot of it is really individual. And unlike certain other art forms, like if you're a live musician or a stand-up comedian or something, you don't get much direct audience interaction as a novelist. Um, it's pretty easy to not engage with the outside world around your work. Like you still have the connection with the outside world of your work, the novel itself, but you don't have much around it. So you have no feedback loop or, or very limited ones. And so something that I enjoy about that sort of, I don't know, interacting with advanced readers one-on-one -on -one is that they're the audience. You actually get to have meaningful conversations where they, I mean, I'm always surprised by it because they will read things into the story that I never wrote into the story. And that's the beauty of art, right? Like we all bring ourselves to it. And so for me, that's actually, it's like intrinsically rewarding, not just, uh, I don't know, not just extrinsically like a, a business strategy for trying to bring the book to the world. That's so beautiful and, and so refreshing. Um, if we could just stay on this theme uh, a little bit longer, um, I do want to come to Reaper and also speculative, speculative fiction uh, um, as, a, as a genre and get your thoughts on that. Um, but just since that you've had such uh, a unique journey uh, as a reader and a writer, a very unconventional journey. I think everyone's journey is unique to some degree, but um, something that's, 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 that you don't hear every day. Um, I'd be really curious to hear about how you feel um, people value fiction today, right? So just to give you for, for context, so let's say the fast moving world of startups and technology, um, I found that a lot of, let's say, people in business have a real mixed relationship when it comes to fiction. You have one set of people that just sort of awkwardly dismiss it as like a, a waste of time, like they can't remember when the, when the last time they picked up a fiction book, <laughs> prefer nonfiction titles, uh, again, how, how do I fix my sync, those sorts of things, that's, that's the stuff like that, let's say, matters to me, just to stay on that metaphor. Um, and then you have another, uh, I found another category of people. Um, that have a real passion for, let's say, science fiction, especially in the part of the world that you are currently in, 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 in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley, right, mm -hmm. um, in, in Oakland. 
and it seems like we live in a world where return on investment really matters to people, whether it's like capital, time, or emotion. Um, do you feel that people are just not getting a good, let's say, return on investment from fiction? Um, or is there something else, let's say, at play here? Okay, the way I think about that question, because that there are a lot of moving parts there. Um, the first thing I'd say is that people aren't just people. So when I write, I don't write for readers, right? Like I don't write for an amorphous general population of readers. Actually, you know, not that many Americans, which is, you know, I'm, I live in California, not that many Americans even read books, right? Like it's, uh, I, I don't remember, I remember looking at the percentages a few years ago and I can't remember the breakdown. It's but, really you know, like, scary. It's, it's really very, depressing. Yeah, <laughs> there's not that many people who read books. Of the people who read books, like almost all of them read like one book a year or maybe two, right? Um, so uh, that's most most people who would even self-identify as saying that they read books. And then, and, and if they're only reading one book or two books a year, most of those books are only the like number one bestsellers of that year, right? So there's this enormous power law at work where most people who even say they read only read like a handful of books, mostly the ones that everyone else is reading at that moment. Um, and then and then after that, you start to get into people who read maybe, you know, a handful of books a year. And then any beyond that, it's even more uh, it's even smaller. So the, uh, the so if you want to write a book and you tr try to write a book for everyone, you're almost guaranteed to fail um, in no small part because like most people don't even read books at all, <laughs> right? So if you're trying to try to get all of them to read it, wow, that is a heavy lift. Like, you know, that, good luck. Um, and so I, I find it to be much more useful to go in the other direction, to rather than think of trying to write for everyone, tr try to think about like a really particular person that you write for. So Stephen King, for example, writes for his wife. So he thinks of his books as basically long form letters to his wife. Um, uh, you know, we've already talked about how in this conversation, like I wrote my, I write my books for myself. Like, like that's it, right? Like there's something I would wanna read. Um, and you, if you go in that direction, uh, suddenly the world can reveal itself to you because, oh, okay, well, who are the people like you that might like the things you like? Or who are the people like Stephen King's wife, <laughs> right? Like apparently a lot of people are like her in terms of their tastes because he sold a lot of books. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, you know, I find that that's sort of like a useful heuristic for um, for the creative act of doing it. But I also think it bears on your question in the sense that like, uh, I don't think everyone should read books. I mean, I think that everyone who chooses not to is really missing out. And um, probably there's a lot there that they would love if only they knew that, that there was all this gold, you know, hidden in the library, right? Um, and and I, honestly, uh, I, you know, I think that uh, how we read books in school has a lot to do with this. Like I really disliked, uh, like when I was in high school and we were assigned reading, I read very few of the assigned books and I would just make up the essays <laughs> about them. Right. Like, um, and like I, I scraped by, I was like, you know, I guess I was able to, I guess I was good at creative writing, <laughs> but, uh, I, but I read a ton. I just didn't like the books that we were assigned in the curriculum. And, and I think that, so I think that our educational system often does people a disservice by teaching them that reading is a chore rather than this golden ticket to like a whole multiverse of ideas and experiences and people. So 
I think that's part of the problem um, for folks who don't f- yet find value in reading. Um, I think that for people who read nonfiction and don't read fiction, I mean, first of all, read whatever the hell you want to read. Um, if you love reading scholarly nonfiction about, you know, the history of financial markets, like go for it. Like if that's your thing, like you should read whatever you want. That's exactly what I was just criticizing high school curriculum for. Um, I do think though, when I have sometimes chatted with friends who have that perspective, that, um, that sometimes they get stuck in a rut. Um, and, it's, and it's the same kind of rut that you encounter in many other parts of life where you're sort of optimizing for things that have an obvious reward, right? So this is the problem of why like big corporations only focus on quarterly returns instead of thinking about like, why do they exist at all? And how are they serving humanity? And what's the point of any of this stuff, right? Um, the, the same is true sometimes in people's reading habits where, uh, you know, I've learned a ton from reading nonfiction. I love reading about how the world works. And to me, fiction offers something very different, which is, is it offers, it, it allows you to explore how the internal world works, how the mind and the heart works and how you how ideas play out concretely inside and outside someone's like you know individual psychology um and prose fiction in particular is really powerful because unlike movies where you have to like send a protagonist out on a deck to drink a glass of whiskey by themselves to show that they're brooding um in prose fiction you're actually in their head right so you actually get this really deep level of sort of cognitive teleportation into another human being that nonfiction rarely offers. I mean, like some memoir can get there, but rarely. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that's really special. Um, I think that there, um, there are a lot of facts in nonfiction and there's a lot of truth in fiction. Um, and I think that's what sometimes some people miss and, uh, and hopefully they'll discover otherwise if they give it a try. That's such a wonderful articulation, honestly. Um, I feel like following from what you've just said, a lot of the problem lies in people struggle with synthesizing a lot of, let's say, complexity and nuance, and when, especially when it comes to their internal world, right? Mm. Like it's difficult, it's difficult to it's really difficult to know yourself, um, let alone like, you know, how, you, how you're feeling. Um, and maybe, as, as you said, that, that's such a great example that the reason companies don't focus, let's say, on ethical or sustainability ind- indices or ask themselves like existential questions about like, what is our place in the world and why does that matter? And instead they focus on stock prices because it's really, really tangible. It's, it's really, really objective. Um, and uh, it doesn't have to, you, don't, you almost don't have to battle with too much nuance there. You don't have to grapple with it. Um, and I feel like so much of it is comes down to more fundamental questions about how do we synthesize complexity? How do we articulate it? How do we, let's say, not just simplify it, but get to the essence of, 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 of who we are and why these things matter. And if we can do that, suddenly it feels like it makes so much sense to read fiction, mm-hmm. right? Um, it, it makes like tangible sense, but perhaps the, the issue lies that for too long, um, it's just been sort of relegated to the domain of the, the intangible um, and the abstract, which is frankly, like a lot of people don't feel comfortable living in that particular mm. particular place. Uh, I, I'm completely with you. I think people should read whatever the hell makes them happy, <laughs> right? Um, 100%. Yeah. Um, I just found that from, in, in my, from my personal experience, I've got uh, one of my like, I don't know, weird social hobbies is I love to recommend uh, books to friends, fiction books to friends who don't necessarily read fiction, but I have uh. a strong feeling that you will love this. So for example, mm. um, um, I really love uh, California. Um, I've mainly been to San Francisco on, let's say, fundraising startup trips, I think three or four times. Um, and one of my hobbies is go to independent bookstores and buy copies mm-hmm. of The Golden Gate, 
by Vikram Seth, oh, yeah. uh, which mm-hmm. um, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know if you're familiar with, but it's a beautiful novel in verse, one of my favorite books. Um, and I love just gifting that to, to people very, very randomly, mm. especially people who don't necessarily read fiction or if they do, they read science fiction, just because I feel it's such a remarkable uh, lens into mm. uh, a San Francisco that no longer necessarily doesn't actually exist anymore um <laughs> but you glimpse it right you glimpse that sort mm. of like artistic renegade um culture and and that 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 phase where it wasn't just sort of uh, uh, the, the core association wasn't just technology and mm. venture capitalists um something mm-hmm. that you talk about in in reaper as well a little bit um, in fact why don't why don't we just segue um to uh reaper um and uh yeah the book um, how, uh, what it's about. Um, I'm halfway through it right now. Really, really enjoying it. Um, I remember when I, when I, when I got it, all the reviews just said that it's like, a, um, you've got to read it in one sitting. It's absolutely like thrilling, <laughs> and it really is. It is gripping, and I just love how like um, each chapter almost focuses on a different world and a different person, and you almost wonder like, where are you going with this, right? Like it feels like a <laughs> I've started like a, it's almost like a collection of short stories and yet they, mm. they, they are brought together in a really, really beautiful way. So uh, I'll stop talking. Please tell us a little bit about it. Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. You, you can tell even by the structural description you just gave why it was so hard to revise. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, where did Reaper come from? Um, really, Reaper came from my friends. Um, I've always, I mean, one of the beautiful things, there, there are many like pros and cons of like living in a place like the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, uh, but one of the really beautiful things is you have a lot of weird, uh, driven, smart people working on very diverse projects, right? Whether they're, uh, you know, trying to genetically engineer new vaccines or uh, working for one of the sort of tech giants that seems to dominate the internet or, you know, have a leather working shop, you know, like in West Oakland or uh, grow avocados. Um, You have just a really diverse, interesting mix of of people. And so... um, I was really drawn to something that a lot of them seem to share. And you could probably say the same thing about people who find their way to many nodes in human history. Like if you think of like Renaissance Florence or, you know, Rome at a particular point of time or Baghdad, um, just these and, and I mean, you could name many, many more, right? But um, these nodes where a bunch of forces in the world seem to be sort of gra- like orbiting a particular place. And um, with, you know, basically with the internet, with computers and then the internet, um, the San Francisco Bay Area has been this, we- has become this like unlikely economic hub of the entire United States. Like, I mean, look at the U.S. stock market, like how many of those like the most valuable companies in the U.S. are mostly on the West Coast. Right. And like they're they're really young. Um, And uh, and at the same time, you have all these other weird forces at work in California where you have the history of um, like the weird history of the state. And then you have all of the artistic movements that sort of found their space to grow here. I now need to read the book, The Golden Gate, you were talking about, because it seems like it gets, you know, from whether it's the beat poets to everything else, there's just, there's a lot at work here. It's messy in a real, you know, it's messy in a beautiful way, in a terrible way. It's just got a lot of threads in the mix. And a lot of the people who make their way here basically are ambitious. And that ambition might be the sort of Steve, Steve Jobsian, like make a dent in the universe and, you know, come up with some kind of new product. But like it could be poetry. Um, it could be cuisine. 
right? Um, it, it, it could be activism, it could be teaching. And that there are a lot of people who, who f- make their way here, just like I lived in San Diego for a long time. I love San Diego. A big reason why people move to a, a beach town like San Diego is because the weather is perfect all the time and you have beautiful beaches to hang out at, right? There are other wonderful things about San Diego. Don't get me wrong. Like it's, a, it's an awesome place. But like why are people attracted to actually move there? Often it's the top line reason. And the same is true in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I was noticing that this thread, this drive, this bias to action, like we were talking about before, um, was, you know, had its particular sort of embodiment in scientists and technologists and artists um, in all of these different, you know, they all had their own missions, but they were all pursuing them with this kind of very powerful drive. And that drive throws off real side effects. And so I wanted to throw a bunch of people like that together and make them crash into each other and see what would happen. And that's where Reaper came from, was, you know, if you really think about, you know, like how far would you go to achieve your greatest ambition, whether that's a poem or a song or what have you, um, uh, that, uh, that I want to explore that um, in this novel. That's so cool. Um, I love that. I, I, I love that. It really does feel like this uh, beautiful, chaotic collision between these really, really <laughs> unlikely folks um, that gets to the core of what a place like, let's say, California is, is also about. I think it gets a lot of sort of bad press uh, today um, for its uh, homogeneity or focus on, let's say, growth and capitalism and technology over all else. Uh, let's say the rental costs in San Francisco, it's, it's not perhaps as li- livable as, as a place um, mm. as it once was. And yet uh, there is still a remarkable amount of serendipity. I absolutely love, love the city. Um, in fact, one of the, one of the really, uh, this links to another uh, another theme in question I wanted to talk to you about, which was a, generally about place, right? Mm-hmm. And place seems to be a really important theme for you in your novels. Um, uh, it seems that you really have a lot of reverence and love for Oakland. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I'd be really, really curious um, to hear a little bit more about that. Um, but just a personal anecdote, actually, when I was reading Reaper, um, when I started reading it, I was sat in a, in a cafe um, close to my home in Mumbai. And uh, there's, a, there's a chapter in the book where I think the, there's a, the character, uh, the podcaster, and she's sitting mm-hmm. with her friend um, in a mm-hmm. cafe. And just before to, uh, she's, she's going for a really, really important pitch meeting. And the way that you describe that cafe looks sh- shockingly like the one that I was sat in. And I felt this weird, oh, really? oh, yeah, that's cool. weird state of meta transportation um in fact i'll take some photos later and i'll Please just send do. them to you yeah. because it was like see that. wow this is um this is crazy uh wild um but i think more broadly i feel like uh this is what's so beautiful about fiction right it's it's mm. it's able to bridge places and cultures in a world that's like again gets a lot of bad press for being polarized that's big becoming more and more divisive mm. um would you like to talk a little bit about place and fiction's ability just to like bring and bridge cultures, disparate cultures? Yeah. Um, wow. Now I want to visit the, the cafe. Um, <laughs> when I was growing up, my, uh, my favorite movie was always Star Wars. And um, I still love it. Uh, can't say I love what Disney's done with it, but I really like the original movies really uh, made a big impact on me. And I remember seeing, I think it was on Twitter, someone was talking about sort of their take on what made Star Wars so special. And there were sort of the things you would, you know, and they were, they were going very in depth on sort of the, the inspirations that George Lucas had with the Seven Samurai, and these, you know, all of these illusions that he was making with the film. Um, but one of the top things on their list that I found really surprising, but then I was like, oh yeah, that's right, was landscape. 
right? Mm-hmm. So I'd never really thought about how big of a role landscape plays in Star Wars. But, you know, when you think of Star Wars, you have like the, you know, the title, you know, <laughs> zooming back against the starscape with like John Williams music playing, right? Um, but then you have like Tatooine, these like this desert planet, Hoth, the ice planet, you have these gas giants, it's you, the, the, uh, um, you know, Endor with its uh, redwood forests, which were filmed, you know, 40 minutes from where I live here. Um, and and that the landscape actually plays this this significant role in those films. That there there's actually like a lot of footage that is just like land like looking out at a landscape for a while. Like in that you would never find in like a Marvel movie today, right? Like that would it would be strange. Um, and um, and so I I thought that was really fascinating and. Um, I've always loved um, spending time outdoors, uh, w- you know, whether that's um, like I love surfing. That's been a big part of my life for a long time. And the fact that it's so dependent, like it's a sport that depends entirely on uh, external factors, on the environment. Right. Like, are, is it too windy? Is it uh, is, is the tide right or wrong? Is there swell in the water? What direction is the swell coming from? How does it hit that particular section of coast? Like it, it it's so it's such a contingent human activity. Um, and I've loved hiking, right? Um, where you're just you're spending time in landscape. But it's not just true of like nature, although nature is a great place to spend time. It's just as true of human environments, of cities, right? Like my favorite thing to do when I travel to a new country is I just walk around the streets for days. Like that's all I do. Like I I don't have a hit list of like sightseeing. I just wander around and see what happens. And that's my favorite thing to do in a a new country. And so I I think that um, landscape is... uh, like really shapes us and uh and you also find in landscape like like anything else we look at like when you listen to a song or when you listen to an album and uh there's a breakup song and you just broke up with your partner like it feels like it's about you right um uh, and same with landscape when you're, you know, when you're, uh, when something is wrong in your life, it's easy to find it in the world around you. Um, and so both, you know, within my own life, I noticed that and, and also in fiction, that's a wonderful window to bring into a character's life by, by showing what they notice in the the world around them you're revealing what matters to them who they are what they're going through right because of the one detail in a, in 10,000 that they are actually paying attention to so i i i think that yeah that place um can be really profound it's the little pocket universe you inhabit um and and so I always try to seek out like the things that I love in the places I live, right? Um, and like I I live in Oakland, which is that there's certainly a lot of scenes set there in this book. But for me, that's also true when I'm visiting other places. I'm trying to to sort of pull back the you know pull back the veil and like sort of see what I can discover there because whatever I discover there is really a reflection of what I'm discovering in myself as I'm growing as a person. Right. And and that's what I'm going for when I'm writing fiction is that that there we talk about things like character and world or exposition, like description, dialogue, action, like like we talk about those things as if they are discrete, (laughs) as if they are separate things. But they're not right like that. They're not at all. They're they're all part of the same thing. That's why there's no difference between saying that like that's a character or that's a world like a world is a subjective thing it's what you it's your world um and when you're writing fiction because you're trying to weave one from whole cloth like you get to tease out those things um and so that's so when i'm wandering around the world i try to pay attention i basically just try to like whatever follow my curiosity like if there's like a weird looking leaf in a neighbor, neighbor's yard, I will stop and spend an awkwardly long period of time examining it, right? Um, or 
Uh, but the same is true when you're talking to friends, right? Like life, if you're a novelist, life is your material. Like how do you write better dialogue? Pay attention to how people speak, right? Like how, how do you make it feel like a scene is really set in Oakland? Like spend some time in Oakland and explore it. Or even if you can't, right? Like if you, if you want to set a scene in a place where you haven't been, like read about it, read the Wikipedia page, look it up on Google Maps, and you don't have to make it accurate, just make, pick the things that resonate with you or that would resonate with the character you're trying to portray. And so to me, that's, that's sort of how I think about place um, in fiction. That's really cool. You know, the, the thing about paying attention is that it often requires you to be uh, really present, right? And, and what I find almost funny about the work that you do and, and your, your journey to date is that um, you are so invested in the future, right? Um, not necessarily the present. Um, I'm not suggesting that there's a dichotomy, but I just find the relationship between the two really, really interesting. Sometimes I do feel that like, oftentimes we are living so far ahead in the future that it, it's stopping us from living in, in the present. Um, and yet sometimes, mm. and, and I feel part of the allure of the future and almost like, let's say the marketing message of the future is that uh, it promises more presence, <laughs> right? <laughs> so the, the, yeah, there's the just a weird like sure. entanglement um, there. Um, and I, I guess it would be really great to hear how you feel um, about the future, if there is a dichotomy with the present. Um, and then if you could even talk a little bit about speculative, speculative fiction as, as an art form, you mentioned it right at the start. Um, maybe actually it would help for, for, for those who are listening who don't necessarily know what it is, if you could perhaps just define it and why you also think it's an important genre. Sure. Uh, okay. Why don't we do those questions and reverse them? So yes. if we start with uh, speculative fiction, um, so speculative fiction in my mind, uh, I mean, first of all, we already talked about how genre doesn't matter that much to me as a writer. Um, but it certainly can help as a reader, right? Like if you're trying to figure out, if you're trying to make sense of a book before you pick it up and start to read it, which is a very useful thing to be able to do, genre can help with that. And um, when I define speculative fiction, what it means to me is that it's, it's a book that's centered on a question, that's centered on speculation. It's basically a book that is the answer to a what if question, right? So, um, even if you have never heard the term speculative fiction, you've probably heard of the movie The Martian, which was based on a book by Andy Weir, right? It was a major blockbuster hit a few years ago. Um, that's speculative fiction. What if an astronaut got stranded on Mars, right? Like that's the whole move. That's the question that drives the movie. Or Jurassic Park, you know, what if you could genetically engineer dinosaurs from a fossil preserved in amber, right? That's spec. It's just that that key that what if question is a really key driver um, of the story, and even just saying it, like that could be on the billboard, right? Like it's the question that drives the story, and, it, and it's actually like very intriguing. Like you you want to know, oh, what what would what would happen if that happened? Um, and uh, and there are a lot of stories that aren't speculative fiction that. We're, I mean, like every story has questions embedded in it, but we were already talking about Star Wars. Like it would be pretty hard to formulate like a single question that defines those movies, right? Like it's not driven in by that in the same way that Jurassic Park is. Um, and so that's how I think about speculative fiction. And I've always really enjoyed it in part. So, wow, you're really getting, you're, you're getting an unusual level of depth on my uh, childhood and life history. But um <laughs> We talked about how uh, in elementary school, my parents sent me to a Waldorf school. Well, in middle school, I, they sent me to a Socratic school. And the sort of the Socratic teaching philosophy is you don't tell kids what the answer is. You just ask them questions and put them in groups and they're tr trying to figure it out. So as an example, in math class, they'd like put up a new kind of problem that 
as a child you haven't encountered before. Hmm. And, and then you have to try to figure it out with your friends. And so everyone's trying, you're going down all these like dead ends, right? Like you're trying something, it doesn't work. You try something else, it doesn't work. But like by the end of it, you're basically arriving at the proof, right? Whereas in a lot of other teaching systems, they would show you the proof and be like, this is how this works. This is how you do this equation, right? Um, and that, I always, that really, as a learning, as a teaching style, that worked really well for me, like for my personality. I, re- I really engaged with that. And I think that's part of what, like, there's something at the core there that I think is powerful in speculative fiction, where you're asking, what if the world was different in this, in this particular way? Or like, what if you were in this kind of a situation, right? And I, and I think that um, that can really drive a story in a fun way, just like even asking the question makes you want to read it. Reading the first chapter should make you want to find out what happens in the second chapter and, and onward. Um, so to me, that's speculative fiction. Um, I would, I guess, to be fair, a lot of that's my definition. Um, you know, other people define these things differently because genre is messy. And sometimes speculative fiction is used to describe sort of all of science fiction and fantasy books, like all kinds of books where they don't take place in the world that as you know it, right? Whether it's magical realism because it feels like our world, but there are some weird tweaks or whether it's a total you know, fantastical imagined place. Um, and speculative fiction is an umbrella that, that some people use to describe that whole sort of neighborhood of literature. Okay, that was, that was the first question. I don't know, should we get into that? Or I think you, had, you, had, you were also asking about the future. Uh, yeah, <laughs> which is a really big topic in and of itself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting what the question was, actually. Was it even a question or just a, a sporadic thought? Um, I think you were asking about like the feedback loop between sort of, you know, yeah, like science fiction and, or living in the future and living or, or in the imagining present. the future and living in yeah. the present, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, okay, so uh, most of my novels take place in the near future, right? Um, and, uh, and there is a certain parallel between, ima- I mean, imagining the near future, if you're going to tell a story that's set there, um, and also imagining a near future that you might want to make happen in the physical world. Like if you see a piece of land and you want to build a house on it, like you have to imagine the house before you build it. And the same is true of inventing new things, right? Like if you're going to invent a new, if, or discover something new in science or invent some new piece of technology or whatever, um, you have to imagine it first. It's pretty hard to do, to do it uh, if you don't imagine it first, even if it doesn't turn out as you imagined it. Um, so I, I think you're right. I, I think that there is this funny gap. I mean, by definition, the future never arrives, right? Like we're only, you can only live in the present. Um, and so it's a fantasy world. Uh, and it's not even just one. It's like everybody has their own visions of the future. Um, and, and I really think that it's more about, like, I just think it's like imagining pot- possible futures is just part of human psychology. Like it's not unique to writing science fiction. It's like that when you're a kid and you you look at a map for the first time and you can like run your finger across it and be like, oh my God, like I've never heard of this place. Like I wonder what it's like there, right? Um, uh, like that's, you're, you're imagining that. You're living in that speculative world, that what if scenario that is only taking place in your imagination. Um, And so I think that imagination has a lot to do with the real world because you have to imagine things to actually do them, right? Um, So I think that there's a strong relationship there. I do think that sometimes people overinvest in imagination at the expense of their life experience, right? Like, if you and I think that there are ex- certainly you can find examples of, of this in science fiction, but you can just as easily find examples in religion, 
or in many other aspects of life where people become obsessed with ideas to an extent that they forget to live in reality, right? Like, I love ideas. I also love reality. I like to live with both. Um, but, it, you know, you can slip into one or the other. Um, and, and I think folks do. Um, and uh, I think that the, uh, the thing that I find sort of the oddest about people's relationship to near future science fiction is that like almost every interview with almost every science fiction author who writes near future science fiction uh, mentions prediction, right? Like, oh, did, did you get this right? Or, or, like, uh, or like, is this what you mean by that, right? Or like, do you think this is actually going to happen? And I just feel like that, that like, I understand why people ask it because as a reader, I read near future science fiction. It's fun to imagine, oh, wow, what if this were real? Like, what if we do live in the matrix, right? Um, but uh, but uh, to me, that's not what makes near future science fiction powerful or compelling. It's that It's that it is just like you can remix a pop song and it has like these weird innovative elements that are exciting, but it also has that chorus that you've heard for years and that you love, right? Suddenly like that piece of music just like tr turns you on. It like you connect with it, right? Really uh, like in this deep, engaged, fast way. And to me, that's what, you know, speculative fiction that is rooted in the present is powerful for. It's that you can take, you get to cherry pick these ingredients from the present, and then you get to mix them all up in a pot and imagine how they might be totally different. And I think that that's entertaining. It's like fun, just like listening to that pop, remixed pop song is fun. And I actually think it goes further than fun, which isn't to say that fun isn't a good endpoint. If the only endpoint is fun, you've already won, right? Let's, <laughs> but, uh, but like the step farther that I think is interesting is that sometimes people criticize, like sometimes cultural critics will um, s sort of like assume that if something is future facing science fiction, that it somehow isn't, like it doesn't have anything real to say about life <laughs> that, right? Like that it isn't like serious literature. Now I think this is actually getting more and more rare, um, you know, but it used to be more of a thing. It was sort of like, oh, that's like genre fiction or whatever. I don't, I think that's, we're getting past that. But to me, what's sort of interesting about like near future science fiction as a genre is that it's the most realistic genre there is. Like books take years to write. If you wrote a book about the world you currently live in, guaranteed it's wrong when it comes out. It'll, it's, already, it's already outdated, right? So you're already writing about a fantasy world that like no one can actually visit. Um, and if you're assuming that the world isn't gonna change, that's not very naturalistic at all, right? Like in fact, the only thing you can say about life is that n it, is always changing, right? Like uh, you're changing, you're growing, the world is changing, it's changing in unpredictable ways. And so to me, the most naturalistic way, the, the, the way of writing fiction that feels truest to the present is to mix it up because that's much more likely to be true for someone reading it than if I try to uh, like sort of just annotate or like, you know, like, try to just directly describe exactly how the world is right now where I happen to be living. So I think that's part of why science fiction is sort of like the most realistic genre. <laughs> maybe, it's, it, maybe it's more like journalism than other, than other kinds of literature for that reason. That's that's really interesting. I've never thought about it like that. There is this, there's this beautiful, like almost temporal conflict when you're writing a novel, which links back to what you were saying at the start, right? The fact that like mm -hmm. uh, you're promoting Reaper right now <laughs> and people are reading it and loving it. Um, but your, let's say, heart and psyche is focused on the next thing, right? Um, Reaper's by definition, the past. 
even though it is it is apparently about the near future. So that that's that's a really really fascinating complex. Um, so beyond let's say entertainment and pleasure uh, for the reader, do you also feel like speculative fiction is a potential like tool for uh, social change? Um, I'm not suggesting that people like yourself are writing to sort of change parts of society, although that's that's also great if, if that's an objective. But I'm, I'm, I'm just really curious, uh, you know, you mentioned like visions for the future and some people have, let's say, utopian, beautiful, dreamy, you know, starry-eyed visions for the future. And then there are really, really dystopian ones um, as well. Uh, they are effective in different ways. Um, how do you feel about them? Is there is there a particular category of, of story or narrative that, that you naturally gravitate to? No. Um, <laughs> I just write something I want to read. So I don't, I actually I don't think it. about that at all. Um, you know, uh, I've had books where reviewers you know, one article would describe the book in the headline as a dystopian novel and a different reviewer would just review it as in a utopian novel. And <laughs> that made me really happy because for me, like the interesting parts of life are the parts that are messy. Like if something is obvious in any direction, I can tweet it. Right. Like that's that, you know, it's 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 clear. It's obvious. Like you have an answer. You can it can fit in whatever 280 characters. Um, If I'm going to write a novel about it. Oh, my God. I mean, I'm going to be working on this thing for years. Like it has it has to have meat. It has to be nothing but shades of gray. And you're trying to sort of, you know, blaze a trail through the wilderness. Like that's what for me excites me about the creative act of writing a novel. So. I like I can't uh, or I have never approached a novel with that uh, kind of a goal in mind of trying to say I'm going to create this kind of a future or you know and that there's only one angle to it to me almost by definition that means it isn't doesn't have the richness the complexity the messiness of lived experience which is the only material I have so um so that's how I tend to think about it. Um, and I also find that like a lot of my favorite books play with that messiness. Like I just read and uh, like, I mean, I should have read it years ago um, because it's not like it's a deep cut, but um, uh, the parable of the sower, Octavia Butler. And like, you could not find a more dystopian outer world that this book takes place in. I mean, it is just like a complete apocalyptic society has fallen apart. Everything's in ashes. Everyone is like murdering and raping each other. Like it is really grim um, and bleak, but it's a totally utopian novel. Like the main character in this book, the whole book is about her being basically exposed to every like the worst possible situations you could ever put a human being into and the whole story is about her like pushing through that because she has a vision for how people can live better together that she is going to make real no matter what happens and so to me like that's the most utopian novel i've ever read even though it took place in like the bleakest future I've ever read, right? Um, And so like, that's what I find interesting about uh, like, yeah, that sort of just like the, the, about the world, about the worlds that you tell stories in. Um, And you asked something at the beginning of that question that I now, what what was it? You'll have to remind me. I'll have to remind myself actually. Um, I think I was asking about um, speculative fiction as a tool for oh. social change, right? Yeah. Um, whether um, it's intended or unintended sure. as well, uh, either way. I think it can be a very powerful tool for social change. Um, 
I just think that it has nothing to do with the writer. Uh. So, like, it is a an incredibly powerful tool for social change. It's just that it's like, that's up to readers. Like the writer has very little to do with it. I think a, you know, a very obvious example of this is 1984. Like George Orwell wrote 1984 about 1948. Like that's when it was written and that's what it's about. It's about Britain in 1948. Um, But like I, you know, when we read it today, if you, during the, uh, in the U S during the, you know, when uh, Edward Snowden released all his his documentation on how the NSA was spying on the entire world, um, that book shot to the top of the bestseller list, right? Like, like George Orwell did not foresee Edward Snowden. Um, what he did is he created an artifact. He created a story, which is, which is his own little pocket universe. And that story contains a really powerful metaphor. And the metaphor, other people hijacked. We all, as readers, hijacked it and said, look, this gives us a way to talk about state surveillance, right? And to talk about what that means in a world where we now have things like mass media and the internet and like all of this and like the modern nation state, right? Um, And so stories are tools for thought. They're intuition pumps um, in that they give you metaphors with which to make sense of the world around you. And the stories, the speculative stories that have these like outsized impacts that really shape how we as a culture, as a collective, as humanity, like think about things, um, just happen because it's the equivalent of a meme, right? I mean, or, or I guess it is a meme in the Richard Dawkins in the original sense, right? Of this like, uh, it's a cultural, like experience that enough people have shared that it becomes a common reference. And so you can use that metaphor to make sense of other things. Like literally, if you read articles about state surveillance, almost every single one mentions 1984, right? Like it's wild how ubiquitous it is. And you can understand why. If you didn't have that common reference point, you'd have to do a lot of work to establish context for someone new to the subject, right? That's why metaphors are popular, or not just popular, but useful. They are shortcuts, they're cheat codes for thought. And so that's, I mean, that's why the, you know, uh, the ancient epic poems that have survived till today, you know, people hijack those fables and stories at every point in history to make their own points, right? Like. You, if you can look back and see how people have reinterpreted like almost every ancient text um, to just mean what they want it to mean based yeah. on the context they're born into. And that's precisely what makes those metaphors socially impactful is that they're easy to hijack, right? Um, and I think that, uh, you know, you, you asked about whether speculative fiction can be a sort of a tool for shaping the future maybe or if i don't know if i'm putting words in your mouth um but like i actually think that oh and but you started by saying like you know there's the fun part there's the entertainment value and then like can they also be a tool and i actually think that like the fun part and the the or the entertainment value is precisely what makes them effective right like people tell stories because they're fun to tell Right. So if you hear a good story, you then pass it along to your friend. Right. Because like it's fun to tell. It gets a good reaction. And then what do they do? They do the same thing. That happens enough. It's a folktale. The folktale goes on for enough generations. Now we're talking about mythology. Right. Now it gets referenced in every new thing because everyone's heard that story as a kid. And the idea like that story is a vector for whatever metaphors are embedded in it. And those metaphors are the tools for thought that we shape the world with. Amazing. You know, I, I find uh, metaphors just just really, really uh, super fascinating, actually, just because it's remarkable how important they are to not even, let's say, grandiose communication or story storytelling, but just making sense of the everyday. And it's also incredible how, like, uh, we we forget that so many things are actually just rooted in metaphor and we take them for reality. 
Um, something that never makes sense to me uh, is, is, let's say, uh, religious conflict, right? And, and, and people who take almost religious texts too literally, right? Because it's like, hey, it's, do you realize that all of this was metaphor and parable? Um, and somehow people take offense to that, right? They're like, how, how can you suggest that? They, you know, and it's like, well, why, why does it make it uh, any less special? Right, just because this thing didn't happen or existed in the mind of, let's say, a really imaginative, um, forward-thinking person, why does that make it any any less meaningful? Um, anyways, th this is uh, uh, something I, I I love to kind of like just think about from from time to time. Um, this has been awesome, man. I I I am uh, I'm conscious of the time and just wanted to wrap up. Um, I would love if you're up for it, if you could perhaps apply your speculative superpowers to fiction itself and the future of fiction, which is a topic um, that this podcast and Lit Visions focuses on and something I'm, 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 uh, I love to think about both as a reader, as a writer, because I feel like it, it, it's, it's fun. It's, it's interesting. As you said, it's almost like a, it's almost a form of like productive procrastination when you're not writing. It's like fun just to think <laughs> about writing and where things are going. And I also find it equally worrisome, right? When, mm. when you read statistics like, wow, people aren't reading anymore or people choose like lots and lots of other mediums. It's like, should I really be reading as many books as I am or should I be writing? <laughs> or is that really the best use of time? So um, anyways, I, I'd love if, if you're up for just speculating on that for, for a few moments, it'd be really interesting. The future of fiction. I mean, so, okay. When I hear that question, like what it makes me think about is that is, is if fiction is, you know, telling a, an imagined story of making up a, a story and sharing that with other people, um, like we just have a lot of mediums for that now. So like, if I was alive 10,000 years ago, you could do that. And it would probably be like an oral performance in front of a small group, right? I mean, that's sort of what fiction was. Um, you might be able to complement that with some cave paintings, right? Um, or, 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 perform, or acting, right? Like, like live performance. Um, and those remain really powerful mediums, right? Like like stage performances, live performances, stand-up comedy, like live storytelling, speeches, like all of those are uh, poetry, right? I mean, like all, all of those are remain very uh, impactful um, uh, forms of fiction. Um, and we've also invented some new things that allow you to, to, to to have other forms of fiction, like new fangled things like printed books, right? That are only a few hundred years old, but have certainly changed the world. Um, and that happens to the, be the form that I spend a lot of time on is novels, but like novels are a very contingent form, just like everything else, just like tweets or TikTok or whatever, uh, Reddit, right? I mean, like, I think you could make a really compelling argument that one of the new forms of fiction that that humanity is collectively creating are like internet conspiracy theories like you thought marvel had a deep universe that had so many rabbit holes like oh my god they're not even coming close right um so i i think that when i think about the future of fiction like to me like it just evolves with the new tools we invent to to tell stories with right so um just in the same way that like uh, broadcast television allowed you to tell co different kinds of stories and then cable television, because it like uh, allowed you to have more than just a few channels made it possible to tell different types of stories. And then like the internet, like with YouTube, like the cable companies didn't know what the hell to do with YouTube. People just like started making stuff up and like that has become its own thing. Um, and so I, I think that there are uh, like, the future of fiction is fractal, right? Like you're, we're gonna keep just going out in every direction all the time forever. Um, in that context, uh, 
the thing I spend a lot of time on, especially, is prose fiction. I write novels, right? And people have been predicting the death of the novel for like multiple generations now. And I mean, we've already talked about how you can't actually predict the future, even if you're writing stories set in it. And boy, have they all been wrong, right? Like someone who thinks fiction is losing relevance, the thing they need to pay more attention to is the real world. Because in the <laughs> real world, more people are reading fiction than ever. Like, and like fiction book sales have just gone steadily up. Like everybody says, oh my God, like the new social media app, like no one's going to read books anymore. And like, that has never been true. Like every single time there are more books sold the subsequent year. That doesn't mean it'll continue to happen that way. But part of the reason why I think that's useful to pay attention to is that is for the same reason that telling a joke in person, people still do it. <laughs> We've been doing it for like tens of thousands of years. It's really a resilient form. It works really well, right? Like it's hard to improve on that. Like it's not the same as watching a TikTok. That's a different thing. That's also good. Um, but like telling a joke over dinner to a group of friends is a, a very resilient form of storytelling. And prose fiction, you know, the novel as a thing, as a cultural artifact, has proven to be far more resilient than you probably ever would have expected if you were around, around when they first started getting written, right? Like, it seems sort of like a weird form, really? Like, you're gonna sit by yourself for like hours and hours and hours and hours and like read something for fun, not because it's the only way to get into heaven or because like you're being paid to and it's fake. Like someone just made this shit up, right? Like, I mean, it, it sounds sort of ludicrous, um, but it's a really powerful form for some of the reasons we spoke about earlier that um, like the, the length, like the, the fact that you can go really in depth and that it's so internal that you're using language as the medium. So the theater is in your mind. You're filming the movie in your imagination. They're just giving, you know, we're giving you the script. And that allows you to have this really intimate connection with the material, with the, the hearts and minds of the people you're reading about. And the writer as another person, I think it's sort of the closest thing we have to being able to, you know, unlock a little trap door in someone else's head and slip inside. Um, and, and so I, that's why I think the novel remains a powerful form. And frankly, like I love playing with like new storytelling tools and toys. Like I, uh, I just find it to be tremendously fun and like a source of creative inspiration, but like, literally nothing I've ever tried has ever made me worry about the future of the novel. Like, I'm like, oh yeah, like you can do some really cool stuff with these other tools. I have no idea if any of them will be long lasting. Almost certainly very few of them will, but like the novel is really good at being a novel. Um, and I, so I don't really see it going anywhere soon. That's such a, uh, such an inspiring note to end on. Um, maybe one quick, just uh, <laughs> lightning sure. question. Uh, a novel that's had a profound impact on you. I know these are these are always mm. tough. How do you how do you just uh, give one? Um, but what's the first one that comes to mind? Well, um, on my shelf right there, I'm looking at William Gibson's book Pattern Recognition. Uh huh. Um, yes. And I love that book. Uh, and the reason I, I think it would be like, if your listeners are still with us, um, <laughs> it, is, it is very on theme for this. If you liked this conversation, you will almost certainly enjoy that novel. And the thing that I think is so fun about it um, is that uh, Gibson uses a science fiction lens to examine the present. So the novel takes place in, I think, was it 2003? I think that's, it was the it, early 2000s is when it was written. And like, it takes place in the time when it was written. Um, but Gibson ha like, has almost the perspective 
on the world he was inhabiting in that time period that an alien would have visiting a new planet or that, I don't know, David Attenborough has like narrating like a, a planet Earth or, you know, something like that, where he he has this sort of like liminal, like outsider, like interpretation of how things work and why things work and like what's really going on behind the scenes that the characters are always teasing out. And so you'll read that book and you're like, yeah, that is about the world I live in, but now I can never look at the world I live in the same way again. And when you can say that after reading a book, that's a powerful thing. Um, So pattern recognition, I highly recommend it. Elliot, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. This has been a fascinating conversation and I really appreciate coming on. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, there are a few simple ways you can show your love. First, do consider leaving a review and subscribing wherever you get your podcasts. This helps more listeners discover it and also just makes me very happy. Second, feel free to share this episode with one friend who loves fiction and you feel might enjoy the conversation. And finally, subscribe to the Lit Visions newsletter on Substack for podcast summaries, future essays, novel recommendations, and discussions about the future of literature. The web address is litvisions.substack.com. Until next time, have a beautiful week filled with fiction and possibilities.